Thank you, Jesus. John 16, 33, Jesus say, I say these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have troubles, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Father, we thank you that we can take heart, we can rest in you. You have given us peace that is not of this world. And so today as we gathered, as we worship you, Lord, renew us, refresh us by your grace because you have overcome the world. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone say, Amen. Before you sit down, high five at least three person and say, Jesus is alive. Woo! Amen. Good morning, church. Welcome to Church of Our Savior. We want to say a big welcome to those who are online with us. We hope that you can join us on site one day. But we want to thank God for a wonderful weekend last week where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, we hit the highest record uh, after COVID for more than 3,500 people coming to church, you know, in a combined attendance. Let's give glory to God. And because of that, maybe some of you are new. You may not know me. My name is Pastor Christopher Ho. There are many Chris here. There are Pastor Chris Young. I'm the Ho one. All right, if you know Hokkien, I'm the good one. Of course, our senior pastor is not here because he's preaching in Grace Assembly. So keep him in prayer. Uh, last week, we received many, many testimonies. And so I thought I would start off by just sharing all these good stories with you. We have this chat group in the staff chat and they have been sharing. And there was this lady who is not a member of course yet and have been attending our church for the past two years. She recently had a bad fall and sprained her leg or something. And then some Kuz ladies brought food to her house to help her out. On top of that, she found there's a ministry called Care at Kuz that helped her to transport her to church every week. So she feels very loved and very cared for. And she wanted to thank the staff and members of this church that has given unreasonable hospitality. So give yourself a round of applause, you know. It's good that we are come, becoming a more loving church every weekend. There's another person that came to church last week. She has been coming to church bringing her son to the children ministry. And the son has been attending. The son has been witnessing to her too. And last weekend, she gave her life to Jesus Christ. Come on. Amazing. On Good Friday, I was uh, attending to some newcomers. There was this particular young person that came to church uh, and he came to me and asked me some question. I've never seen him uh, before. And then she, he said he was new. He has been attending our cell group. So I asked him, how do you come to church anyway? He said, oh, I fell asleep on a bus. And when I woke up, the bus stopped just outside the church. So I decided, why not? I just come to church for the very first time. He came to church, gave his life to Jesus. Now he has been attending church every weekend. Come on. <laughs> uh, it's not something that, you know, pastors can do. We can do many things. Uh, it's, we can't really stop the bus. We can't really make him sleep and wake up at the right time, right? So I think God is doing something wonderful. Last weekend, we also witnessed our splash evangelistic birthday, not birthday party, I was told, evangelistic parties. And we have a total of 134 children with 21 newcomers, seven first-time salvation and 20 rededication to the Lord. If you want to clap, you can do better than that and give glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. You are alive and you are here with us. And so if you have accepted Christ over the last few weekends and you are new, we want you not just to attend service, but to also be rooted in community because we are a family, right? How many of you remember the Kuz family creed? Raise your hand. If not, we can revise today because we know some of us are new. So let's revise the family creed. F stands for fun at all times. Say it together. Turn to your neighbor and do this. Fun at all times. A, touch your neighbor and say, affirm always. M, make time to connect. I, ignore offenses, right? If your wife is beside, just rub over <laughs> her shoulders. L, listen to understand. And Y, Liverpool fan. You never walk alone. You are not alone. <laughs> you know, someone says to live above with sins we love. Oh, that will be glory. But to live with them on earth below, that's a different story. 
community affects one another and sometimes can be helpful or unhelpful. Two weeks ago, I talked, uh, I speak about a sermon on Palm Sunday about donkey, right? You know, sometimes we can hee haw, hee haw. We can say things that are unkind. And I thought today, maybe I'll start off with another donkey story. There's a lot of children around. And I thought I'll start with a children's story. It's a story about a man and his son who were once going with their donkey to a village. And as they were walking along by the side, some countrymen passed them by and said, You fools! What is a donkey but for you to ride on? And so when the man heard this remark, decided to put his boy on a donkey and went on their way. But soon they passed through the town and saw a group of men. One of them said, See that lazy youngster. He let his father walk while he rides on the donkey. Shame on him. And so the man heard this and ordered his son to get off. And then he got on the donkey himself. When they hadn't gone far, they passed by two women of whom they said to one another, shame on that lazy man to let this poor son drag along while he sat on the donkey. The man didn't know what to do. So he said, boy, why don't we both sit on the donkey? So by this time, they had come to the town that they wanted to go and the passerby began to jeer and point at them. And so they stopped and asked, what are you jeering about? He said, aren't you ashamed of yourself for overloading that poor donkey? You and your hawking son. And so finally, they decided, you know what we should do? We should just carry the donkey. <laughs> Have you ever done this? You know, you listen to feedback, you try to please people, and then in the end, your face becomes like this. Quite like that, huh? Ever try to please everyone and in the end, no one is pleased? And sometimes we also don't realize that the words that we speak and heard has got impact on others and upon ourselves. Because the creation was created when God spoke. God spoke and creation came into being. And today, I want to talk about the power of words. Turn to your neighbor and say, your words have power. How you give words and how you receive them are very important. In 1862, there was an old adage that says like this, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never harm me. But this is really old. Because in our day and age, this song has been changed. And I went to the internet and I found some songs written by young people these days about sticks and stones. And this is what they wrote. A lady by the name of Dylan says this. In her chorus, she sang, I've been told it's sticks and stones that leave you broke. But it's the words you throw that hurt the most. So I'll take the sticks and stones. I'll take the sticks and stones. Another one by Francis, Oliver Francis. In the chorus, he says this. Sticks and stones could never break me, but your words cut deep as of lately. When you get home, all you'll find is my body face down and lifeless. Wow, very strong words because in this day and age, we recognize that sticks and stones can hurt you, but your words can hurt you even deeper. And maybe some of us unconsciously have been hurt or have hurt others with our words. In Proverbs 18.21, it says this, Death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat of its fruits. So words have the power to inspire, to motivate, to educate, even to change the world. But it also has the power to harm, to abuse, torment and destroy the world and sometimes destroy our own children. You know, parents sometimes when we get really impatient, we can say some of the unkind words to our children. Sometimes even our children unconsciously can say very unkind words to our parents. We say, I don't like you. <laughs> I don't want. This is the most common words that I've heard from children. I don't want. <laughs> and because of a rebellious heart, they say this. But in my time, all right, maybe some of you similar to mine, our parents don't really encourage children. I don't really uh, hear my parents saying, I love you. You are so good. You know, you are a champion. I don't get to hear all these things. Uh, we get to hear what? When our neighbors come to our parents and say, Wow, your son very smart. Huh? Say, No, lah, very stupid one, huh, my son. <laughs> or they say, Wow, you got a very, very uh, handsome son. Huh? I say, No, lah, very ugly. Huh? Because they're comparing to what they see on TV. <laughs> and they felt that if they say anything too much, they are being too proud. And so it's humble. It's a humble thing to do. 
So I grew up needing a lot of affirmation because of the lack of it in my childhood until I become a Christian. And I realized that actually whatever God said about me is actually more important. But today, we will recognize that even as Christians, we know that words have power and we know all these things in our mind, sometimes we still slip up. Because while you try to say the right thing, end up saying the wrong thing. There was a story about this uh, wife who was looking at a mirror and then say, wow, I look very fat, huh? And then turn to the husband and say, hey, can you say something to encourage me? So the husband looked at her and say, oh, your eyesight very good. <laughs> so he said something to encourage her, but it ended up discouraging her. <laughs> so in James chapter 3, verse 2, shall we read them together? Go. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. So when you know that you cannot be a perfect person, meaning you say we slip up here and there, I have this rule in my family. Uh, this one came from my wife. He said, everybody remember this, the principle. Nothing good to say, don't say. <laughs> so why don't you turn to your neighbor and to your children and say, nothing good to say, don't say. <laughs> It's better not to say than to say the wrong things. And after that, you have to make remedy for that. But today, we want to look at the Bible because the Bible is full of ex examples and proverbs on the right use of words. I want to bring out two Bible characters because I think what they spoke uh, is actually impactful. How you give words matter. And sometimes you can give words by speaking. Sometimes you can give words by writing. And you can give words with your body language even. But this is a story about Gideon. You remember the story where Gideon was actually fighting the Midianites with 300 men and they won the battle? And this is right at the tail end in Judges 8.1. It says this, after the battle has kind of finished, then the men of Ephraim said to him, what is this that you have done to us? Not to call us when you went to fight against Midian. And they accused him fiercely. <laughs> Meaning you say they came to Gideon and was quite angry. And they were saying, how come you didn't ask us to go into battle with you? They are like people who is in your project team and you have done all the work in the project and then the, the teacher has given you an A but given the, your, your friend a B. And then your, your friend came and said, how come you didn't ask me to do more? You know, we have people like that show up after all the job has finished and, and came to you with such fierce and harsh words. How would you respond? Now you can imagine Gideon had just finished a fight, huh? killed all the Midianites. He would probably easily take up a fight with all these people from Ephraim, right? But look at what he said. Because words matter and he said the right words. And that's most important. In verse 2 and 3, this is what he said. He said to them, what have I done now in comparison with you? It's not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the grape harvest of Abizal. God has given into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb and Zip. What have I been able to do in comparison with you? Now, he looked at them and he thought to himself, these guys probably think I'm going to take the spoils and the land. So instead of scolding them back, he actually affirmed them. And they say, what have I done that you have not done? Aren't you better than me? And Guinness' words calm these people down. It reminds me of Proverbs 15.1 that says, a soft answer turns away wrath, isn't it? And so the Bible says, then their anger against him subsided when he said this. So Gideon's words resolve a conflict. And many of us are like him, right? We are peacemaker. When you see a situation that's very tense, you are able to release words that bring peace and unite people. And how you give words are very important, but how you receive words matter too. Now, Another Bible character didn't do so well, and that's King Rehoboam. It's the son of King Solomon. Now Solomon has died, and King Rehoboam went to Shechem, a place where they gathered all of Israel. At this point of time, there was no divided kingdom. Everybody was gathered there. And there was a general by the name of Jeroboam who had actually fled from Solomon. This time now, when he heard the new king would be installed, he gathered many of the Israelites to Shechem together. And when they came to Rehoboam, they said these words, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now therefore, lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke on us. And we will, louder, we will, serve. we will serve you. That's actually quite a good feedback and response, isn't it? And then Rehoboam said, 
Go away for three days, then come again to me. So the people went away. Now, in a passage, you will read about how Rehoboam went to consult the old people, and the old people say, listen to the people. And then he did not stop there. He went to look for the young people, and the young people say, you know what? Go and show them who you are. Let them know your power. Let them know that you are the king now. And so the Bible says this. On the, after three days, they came to the king in verse 13. This is what the Bible recorded for us. It says, And the king answered the people harshly, and forsaking the counsel of the old man had given, he spoke to them according to the counsel of the young man, saying, My father, make your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips. I will discipline you with scorpions. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. He did not listen to the old man's advice. So actually, it's good for young people to listen to the older's advice. Huh? They are very wise. Amen? amen. All the old people say amen. <laughs> <laughs> but after this, you know what happened? The kingdom was divided. And Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. In 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 19. Now, Rehoboam's words actually created a conflict. And if you compare the two Bible characters, you have Gideon in a different context, totally different context. He was facing external war, external fight, but Rehoboam was actually having peace. There was no external war or whatsoever. Gideon, on the other hand, was dealing even with internal fight. There are people from the tribe of Ephraim coming with him with harsh words, with rebellious hearts. But yet, Rehoboam... He was dealing with willing hearts. The people come with a request, with some advice to say, we will serve you if you do this for us. But yet, look at the difference. Gideon's words resolve a conflict. Rehoboam's words created a conflict. And at that point of time, the kingdom was divided. Friends, your words can unite or divide. Choose what kind of words you're going to use because the giving of words and the receiving of words are very important. So when you give words, be disciplined in what you say because this is not from me. It's from the book of James. James chapter 3, verses 3 to 5 says that if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the sheep so-so. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the wheel of the pilot directs. We read together the red words, together go. So also, the tongue is a small member. Yet it boasts of great things. So our tongue can be very small, but it's like the brighter. It's like the rudder. It can control the whole being. And that's why in chapter 3 of verse 6, it says this, And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. So our tongue is very important. It is like when you're angry, hold your tongue. If you don't hold your tongue, you'll be like this husband who came back very angry. Even though the wife opened the door, welcomed him with a smile, he said, Get lost! And because of that word, it affected the wife and the wife got angry. Look at the son who was playing toys, but the house was messy. Turn to the son and say, I told you how many times to keep your toys. You don't play anymore. Go ahead, keep your toys. And so he got upset, turned around, saw the sister holding the ball that was owned by him, start to punched the sister and the sister cried. <laughs> was very, very sad. Sister got no one to turn to but the dog and started to kick the dog. <laughs> so the dog was very upset. <laughs> Went to the sister's room, looked at the door and then bite the head off. <laughs> so what do you learn from this? Other than, you know, your frustration of your words can impact others. Actually, very simple. If you are angry, when you go back, don't shout at your wife. Just go straight to your daughter's room and bite off the head of the door <laughs> and save a lot of trouble. <laughs> but words have impact. Richard Foster says this, the tongue is a thermometer. It gives us our spiritual temperature. It is also a thermostat. It regulates our spiritual climate and temperature. Control of the tongue can mean everything. Everything. So I always say, you know, when you receive something, don't react first. Respond. All right? Everybody say Respond. Respond is better than react. Many of us react faster than we think. Uh, we, you know, I've been married for almost 24 years already. 
And in my early years uh, with my wife, we always react in our speech. We used to say, you always this, always that. How come you never turn on this? Never? You, 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 you. So we went to see a counsellor. So the counsellor advised us, you know, you don't always say, you always. You must say, I feel. When you're angry, you say, I feel angry. I feel this. So I came back home. So we discussed about this. Okay, we'll change. We'll change and we'll listen to the instruction. But it turned out that every time we are upset, I, we turn out to say, I feel you always do this. <laughs> So we just combined the two sentences together. It didn't really help because we listened to the instruction, but we missed the point. You fulfill the goals, but you forgot the purpose. Sometimes we can do that. Yeah, I listened to the counselor already. I listened to this already, but you missed the point. You missed the heart of the matter. Because when you give words, you need to learn how to give it correctly. There is one whose rash words are like sword thrust, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. And so learn to give healing to others. Now I learn to speak nicely, not just to my wife, but to my children. You know, when my children become teenagers, uh, one of the things that I cannot stand was when they sleep very late. Or should I say they sleep very early. They sleep so early, it's about 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. You know? And I have a problem with that because I need to give discipline to my children. So I have curfew for them to come back. You know, I have, you know, things order and rules in my family. And one day when I saw my daughter after prayer meeting, uh, still out there, midnight already, still haven't come back, I got really upset. And I decided to drive out there, pick her. But while I was picking her, I was thinking to myself, you know, I, I need to show her what a father is. I need to set some real rules. I need to confiscate the phone. Uh, confiscate the phone. So when we got in the car, I didn't say anything, you know, because I was holding my tongue. I said, don't say anything. Nothing good to say, don't say. So the only thing I said was, give me your phone. <laughs> so she gave me the phone. Then I said, you won't see your phone for one week. Wow. So she was quite scared. Uh. She knew that, you know, because she didn't tell me she was late. You know. So I drove back, but I was still very upset. So I decided, I dropped them. I went away, uh, almost midnight, uh drive somewhere out there and I sat there I said, God, I'm so upset how I cannot get over this upset feeling. Can you please help me? <laughs> and, and so I thought I would stay there for a long time but after 15 minutes I heard God spoke to me. He said, Chris, uh, why do you make such a small thing become such a big thing? <laughs> and I was convicted. I said, oh, actually it's true. I was almost becoming like real boy. So I decided to become like Gideon. I said, we should resolve conflict. So the next day, we resolved. In fact, I didn't say anything negative. So we sat down and, and had some boundaries. So I asked my children uh, to come to my office and we sat down and had a formal meeting. You know, <laughs> I sat there and I said, you know, do you agree? They said, yeah, 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 we agree. Say, so come back before midnight uh, and then sleep early. Uh. They say, what time are you supposed to sleep? Say, we won't sleep past 12. I say, okay, very good. So I thought, you know, happily ever after. Cai kuai, you know. So, so a few days, a few weeks ago, I thought, hey, I woke up in the middle of the night. Like nowadays, I don't know why I have to wake up in the middle of the night to go to the toilet. <laughs> Maybe getting old. So I woke up and I saw the light was still on. So I turned around and I said, hey, she's still up doing some stuff. And, you know, I, sometimes I think that they are chatting with friends and doing a lot of stuff that I think is unnecessary. I wanted to tell her off. Then I thought to myself, okay, I've learned from the past mistake already. Now I just sleep. The next morning, I saw a text. It, it was a text from, you know, some of this conversation about work. And so they were discussing, oh, how this subtitle need to be edited. Then I also agree. I said, yeah, 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 shoot. You know? And then I realized that actually they appointed my daughter to do the editing. <laughs> so whole night she was editing for a work that we all agree in the leadership, in the staff team, and then they assigned her to do And so the whole night, whole, whole morning, she was working on that. So when I realized that, I got up in the morning, I looked at her instead of saying, why you sleep so late huh, yesterday? I said, thank you for serving the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Giving words. Learn to hold your tongue. Learn to think about the context. But however, I just also want to say, uh, some of you children need to sleep early. Lah. Because you're not really doing any work. You're just playing games, okay? Number two, we need to be thoughtful in what we say. Think before you speak. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it important? Is it necessary? Is it kind? So give kind words. Is it necessary to say these things? You know, uh, sometimes we Christians say we don't gossip one. 
We only pray about it. We go to church and then we say all these things. I just like, we need to pray for Gim. Uh, you know, what Gim was going through. You know why? We need to pray for Pastor Debbie. Uh, and then we start sharing a lot of stuff. And then we unconsciously are gossiping about their problems without permission. And so I think it is important for us to know. Proverbs 16, 28 says this. A dishonest man spreads strife. A whisperer separates close friends. So learn to let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. How do you season your speech with salt? Right? Take some salt and then start putting it in your mouth? No. Seasoned with salt means that whatever you say must be kind. Everybody say kind. Must be thankful. Hey, continue. Eh? <laughs> must be gracious. Yes. So learn to express this and think about how you're going to form your words before you say them. I remember uh, Pastor Jennifer Hing, used to be our pastor here, uh, posted something that was brilliant in, on her Facebook social media. And she said this, she was on the MRT and she was standing there and she noticed there was this either an old lady or pregnant lady that needed a seat. But right in front of her was this young man who didn't notice was doing his own thing. And so he she decided she wanted to inform this young man. But instead of just announcing to everybody, she decided to write on a piece of paper and say this, you will look really cool if you stand up and give up your seat for the auntie and slip it to him. And so he saw the note and immediately got up and gave his seat up. And I thought that was brilliant. That was so gracious of how she did it. Because if I'm the one... I would go there and say, hey, young man, never see this auntie. Ah. <laughs> so it would be very different, right? So I learned that, you know, you can do it this way because to make an apt answer is a joy to a man and a word in season, how good it is. We need to give word in season. And sometimes word in season means that we do correction. But correction is also not rejecting people. And all of us love to correct people. Yeah, but giving correction on the, in the right time is very important, especially when your you know, husband and wife, when your husband is very tired, come back home, don't talk about all the laundry, uh, the lights never switch off, uh, all the things that you know, he may not think that is very important. <laughs> because speaking the right words in the right time to the right person is the right thing to do. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say this? Speaking the right words in the right time to the right person is the right thing to do. You know, when I was young, I, I always managed all these youth group, and they always turn up late. And I remember there was once I was so upset. I said, you know how you cannot be late. You know, everybody not here except you. And I was scolding the only person that was punctual. And all the late people was not there to listen. <laughs> and so the poor person came to me and said, you just now talk to me like I was late, but I thought I was the only one punctual. I, I talked to myself, I said, yeah, I was scolding the wrong person because all this person was not there. And so you need to release the right words to the right person in the right time. Then it's the right thing to do. So have the right context. And so you give the right words, be thoughtful about what you give, be disciplined. Next, when we talk about receiving words, we must listen to understand. Listen to the heart more than the words because we know that in communication it's more than words your body language and sometimes you can write letter and some letter can be very fierce so listen to the heart behind the matter right so there's a, a funny story about this man who thinks that the wife really cannot hear properly so he went to the doctor and said can you give me some advice I think my wife uh, got hearing problem so the doctor said why don't you do a test you go back home and then if you see your wife you know, you stand about 15 feet away and then you ask the question. If there's no response, then go nearer, nearer and see how serious the condition is. So he did this test. Uh. He went to the kitchen and saw the wife was cutting carrots. And he said, honey, what's for dinner? No response. <laughs> so he got nearer. Honey, what's for dinner? No response. Finally, he got to just beside her. Honey, what's for dinner? And then <laughs> the wife turned around and said, for the third time, I'm telling you, be still. <laughs> for the third time. <laughs> Don't know who got hearing problem now. <laughs> so sometimes we think that the person got hearing problem. Actually, it's you have hearing problem, right? And, and so we need to really wait and see. And as we receive words, we must think about the context and be nice. 
have empathy before you share. Now, this is a, there's a interesting video that I, I thought I would share. I normally share this video uh, during premarital counseling to show that couples must learn to give the right words at the right time. All right, have a look. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless and I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there... Stop will... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing... You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. Yeah, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just... Sometimes it's like... There's this achy... I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Come on, if you would just- Don't! Try to see things my so sometimes it's the nail, sometimes it's not the nail. When do you tell the person? James 1, 19-20 reminds us to be quick to listen, to hear, and slow to speak, slow to become angry, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. But what about the lady? And you know, what about us, some of us? We really do need some good criticism, isn't it? Listening to good critique is important. Don't just listen to the good things about you. Listen to some of these good critique. But it all depends on who is telling you, isn't it? If people who love you tells you that, Parents who love the children tells you certain things. Don't react. Children, don't react. Your mommy and your papa loves you very much. They are not here to nag at you. They are here to teach you. And so correction is not rejection. Proverbs 15, 31 to 32 says, The year that listens to life-giving reproof will dwell among the wise. Whoever ignores instruction despises himself, but he who listens to reproof gains intelligence. So if you want to become wise, listen to all this good critique, right? Turn to your neighbor. If your, your children sitting beside you or your parents sitting beside you, just turn to them and say, I love you very much. Very good, right? Other than I love you, you know what you need to say also? You need to say, I am sorry. <laughs> because sometimes we really need to say that. Recently, my, my wife gave me a very long letter, sent me a message, very long message, huh? but it's not a love letter. It looks like a summon. <laughs> I told people, well, I look at it, I think I got yellow card already <laughs> because I was very busy. Huh? So he wrote wow, a very long story. <laughs> actually, at every point, I wanted to you know, respond. Huh? Point one, actually not really like that one. Actually, the context is point two. And actually, it's not me, huh? it's... Pastor Gim, or something like that. I want to blame others. So I wanted to respond. But then in the end, I just reply, I'm sorry, I'll do better. And, and that was it. When I saw her, actually I was in fear and trembling. But thank God, she cooked the, you know, the, the thing I love most. So I know that she just needs me to listen and also to recognize that I need to learn something here. So friends, ignore offenses. And recognize that when you receive negative words, there are people who are hurting. And so because of their hurt, they are saying this thing. Choosing whether to confront, overlook, or to ignore an offense is wisdom. The Bible says a man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to overlook an offense. So in my experience, many people actually don't really want to offend you intentionally. They do it unintentionally because of what they went through. A few years ago, I was, uh, you know, bringing youths to a uh, youth camp, and I was going through this uh, school. And in this school, there's this guard who actually will always raise the barrier when vehicles come in. So I went in, dropped the guys, came back, raised the barrier, went out. I did this for about three times, to which the third time, the barrier did not open. <laughs> and I look at the guard. 
I, I wanted to signal to the guard, maybe the guard was sleeping. <laughs> and then the guard looked at me with a very fierce face and shouted like, how many more times? And I, I knew that he was irritated. Uh, but uh, that triggered me, you know, because instead of responding kindly, I reacted and said, five times. Actually, only one time, I just anyhow say a number. And so I thought to myself, ah, oh, my day is ruined. <laughs> so I went in, I was with the youth, and the next day, I decided to visit them again because I went back. And when I was driving, I was singing worship songs. And then halfway through, I was thinking to myself, oh, I'm going to meet the guard again. I don't know whether the barrier is going to open for me. <laughs> and so while I was thinking about that, a thought came to my mind. I said, why don't you buy some coffee for them, for the guards? I said, coffee? Why should I buy coffee? He offended me. No, I offended him. <laughs> I said, I won't want to buy coffee. But I knew that it was, you know, the prompting of the Holy Spirit. So I told God, I said, well, if that's really from you, because that may be not from you, uh, maybe from the devil or something, you know. So I said, maybe not from God, uh, I test first. So I said, if I turn around, go into the petrol kiosk, I'm going to look for this brand of coffee, which I know not many petrol kiosks has. And I said, if I see this, then it's a sign that I should buy coffee for them. So I went into the petrol kiosk, and lo and behold, the coffee was there, and it was on offer somehow. <laughs> so... <laughs> I decided, wow, this must be from God. So I obeyed the Lord. I brought the coffee and then I drove to the, to the school. And I drove to the school. The barrel was open. I went in. I stopped the car. I decided to bring the coffee there. And in my mind, I was rehearsing what to say, you know. And I was saying, you know what? I will say to him, put the coffee there first and I smile at him and say, yesterday you were very rude to me, huh? but I forgive you with this coffee. <laughs> but... <laughs> Thank God I didn't do that. <laughs> because when I went there, I think something took over me. I think it was this Holy Spirit. Lah. I put the coffee down and I said, I'm so sorry for causing you trouble yesterday. He looked at me and he smiled. And he said, you do not know some of these students here. And then I turned out, because I was expecting a Christian in the Christian school, right? But he was not a Christian. And then he downloaded to me many of the things that he was struggling with. And I, I thought to myself, wow, there's so much hurt within him and that's why it's overflow flowing out of him. Out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. And that's what God is reminding us. But if you receive all these negative things, let us be a cushion so that we can reflect God's love to others. Amen? Amen. Hurt people, hurt others. Healed people will heal others. And finally, as you receive words, remember, while you cannot stop people from saying negative things around you and about you, you don't have to believe in what they say. What God says matter more. Amen? Whose report are you going to believe? If people say you're stupid, you're good for nothing, you will never change, just like how I used to believe when I was young, I look in a mirror and I say you are a failure, you, are, you will never amount to anything, but yet God's word say differently. And even while you are serving the Lord, there will be people who will be saying bad things behind your back. And you know that. And in 1 Peter 3, it says this, but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honour Christ the Lord as holy. In verse 17, it says, For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. There will be situations where people will say bad things about you even when you have not done anything. But remember, live in such a way that if anyone should speak badly of you, no one will believe. Live in such a way whereby the conduct uh, of your life is consistent with what you believe. Because what God says about you is more important than what others say about you. It's more important than what you say about yourself. Because other people may label you this way, but God has a better label for you. Amen. You know, when Gideon was fearful of the enemies, the Midianites, he said, my clan is the weakest. I am the least in my father's house. But God called him a mighty man of valor. That's before what Gideon has done. When Abraham was unsure about the future, God called him a friend. When David sinned against God and committed adultery, God called him a man after God's heart. When Mary, who was gossiped by many people because she was pregnant, the angel calls her highly favoured. Peter betrayed Jesus. Jesus calls him the rock on which he built his church. Paul persecuted the church. God called him a chosen instrument to carry the gospel 
to the Gentiles. God has a vision that you do not have. God has a vision for people, for the hurting, for the downcast, for those who have even sinned against the Lord. But yet God is able to see the destiny for all of them. And so if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you must know that you are accepted. You are chosen. You are free. You are forgiven. You are a new person. You are a child of God. You are made in the image of Jesus Christ. You belong to Jesus. Amen. Let's give a clap offering to God. Receive that. Believe that. Don't just receive the words of man, but remember the words of God is more important than the words of man. And so today I want to close with this story. It's a story I found on the internet about this guy called Johnny Lingo. Now, Johnny Lingo is a shrewd, honest, well liked Polynesian trader. Johnny has come back because she, he actually knew a girl by the name of Mahana, knew her for a long time. But Mahana was not very beautiful. And in this place, where, when they got married, they would ask for a bright price. The father would ask for a bright price. And how did they go about getting married? They would give cows. And that's why I got cows. Huh? They would give cows as a bright price. So if you're beautiful, you'll get more cows. Huh? If you're beautiful and smart, then maybe you have five cows, you know, four cows to five cows. And so everybody would be bragging about how many cows their husband bought. And give. Mahana was always being, you know, verbally abused by the father. The father would say, You're so ugly. When you get married, I don't know whether I will have even one cow, maybe half a cow, maybe the cow's head only. And so she grew up not feeling good about herself. She behaved, you know, also in a very boyish manner. So even the island, islanders, you know, those ladies, they don't think that she will, you know, be married even. But Johnny Lingo knew about her. And Johnny Lingo one day told the father, I'm going to marry your daughter. The father was very pleased because this is a rich man. And so they were discussing. He said, we should come for a discussion and bargain and talk about the bride price. So the father, very shrewd now, also thinking, even though I say that I may not get one cow, but this guy is so rich, I should ask for three cows minimum. <laughs> but all the islanders, they were joking. They would say, you know, I would think that since this businessman is so smart, Maybe won't even give any cow. But to all their surprise, Johnny Lingo brought eight cows. <laughs> everybody was shocked. Eight cows for Mahana. So everybody was talking about it. And so they got married. They went away for honeymoon for a long time. And finally, they came back. And this time round, Johnny brought the wife, Mahana, who used to behave very boyishly, now walk like a lady. Very well dressed, with makeup, smell nice. And she spoke with confidence. She spoke and all the ladies in the island gathered around to listen to her and they, they could see there was a tremendous change in her life. And so they gathered and said, what did Johnny do to you? Did he bring you to plastic surgery? He said, no, 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 no. Did he ask you to do this, uh, you know, buy a lot of new perfume? No, 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 no. My, my husband just loved me and cared for me. And he said, how did the change happen? He said, you know, Every night, I kept thinking, actually, I'm an eight cow lady. <laughs> My husband actually used eight cows. Eh. Nobody in the island has eight cows. <laughs> I have eight cows. I'm an eight cow lady. So every night, I have been thinking about this and I thought to myself, I better behave like an eight cow lady. <laughs> And so because of their belief, because of their understanding, there was change coming from the inside out. And friends, today, you don't need eight cows to affirm you. You have the blood of Jesus Christ that's covering over you from top to bottom because Jesus Christ went through a lot more suffering. Jesus Christ was faced with mocking. He was faced with weeping. He was faced with jeering. And even when she faced all these things, he was crucified. He, he actually exchanged this life, his life, his own life with yours so that you can live a life that reflects his love, his grace, his glory. And in Hebrews 4, 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with your weaknesses, but we have one who in every way has been tempted as we are yet without sin. And so therefore, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. You know, today we are going to receive communion. 
And this is the throne of grace. This is where we come before the Lord and then we say, Lord, we are here to receive your mercy and to find grace to help us in a time of need. And so friends, if you have ever been ridiculed before, you have ever been labelled as a good for nothing, you have ever been labelled as a failure today in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, debunk that, throw that away because that's not who you are. God has something better for you. God has a destiny for you. He has a purpose for you. Do not just attempt to finish the goals but fail to understand the purpose He has in your life. Live a life that truly reflects Christ's grace, love and glory. Let's bow our heads. I believe this morning, whether you're on-site or online, God is already speaking to you. He's here with us. His Spirit is with us. And while you are listening to this, I want to pray especially for some people that I felt prompted as I was preparing the message that you have been hurt for many years in your environment. Or maybe you're no longer in the environment, but you have been hurt when you were young. And right now, you can still remember some of the words that are spoken against you. Some of the words that is labored on you. That called you a good for nothing, a prostitute, a sinner. You will never change. In the name of Jesus right now, we want to release you. And if that's you and you want healing, at the count of three, whether you're online or on-site, just quickly put up your hand because I want to pray for you. One, two, three. I see many hands raised. Right? Any one of you who needs prayer. Thank you, Lord. Those online, the Lord is watching. The Lord knows. Father, I pray for those who have raised their hands. I pray for those, Lord, who has been hurt before. Right now, in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, remove all these lies from them, from their minds, in Jesus' name. Lord, give freedom. Give freedom, Lord. Let your word renew them. Let your word refresh them. Let your word change them and transform them from the inside out so that they live freely they live this abundant life with purpose and to fulfill the destiny you have for them. We also want to pray for some of us who needed mercy, who needed repentance because we have released words that's unkind. And so help us, Lord, to live and to give words that will bless others in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord.